Good afternoon. In dying, Christ destroyed our death. In rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in his baptism, Robert Allen Wood, or as we knew him, Woody, put on Christ. So in Christ may Woody be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I hold the keys of hell and death, and because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we've gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Woody. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. My name is Brett Salzgiver, and I'm a pastor at Fishburne United Methodist Church. And I think it's important to get out the obvious. It sucks to be here today. Huh. None of us planned on meeting and sitting in this place on this day under these circumstances. There is no need to hide the reality that we don't want to sit here. That when we walked in, we carried grief and anger, uncertainty, regret, so many different emotions on our shoulders, and I want you to know that is okay. Our purpose today is simple, to celebrate the life that we love so much. Now, I will tell you, I have a wonderful ego, but even I do not have the ability to preach anyone into heaven or hell. That's not our purpose today. Our purpose today isn't to sit and be angry at God, going, God, you did this. Because if God killed Woody, then I need to find a new God, because I don't think that's how God works. So we're here to sit and to celebrate and to even struggle. We're going to do that through talking and through laughing and through crying. Um, I also think, uh, if you're curious why I just came in kind of late, I think it's really important to know. Uh, they normally say you're not used to a new appointment for 18 months, and that includes your whole family. Uh, we just moved to Hershey uh, in July, so this morning I told the family, I said I'll be here about an hour early. Uh, my fat little fingers hit the directions, uh, and all of a sudden I'm going, I don't really remember Paul Robert being anywhere near Humboldt now. <laughs> And I pull in, and that annoying chick in the thing says, you know, turn left, you're at your destination. And it's some woman's house. I know that because she's mowing the lawn. And I'm going, I don't think this is where I'm supposed to be. So luckily, I spun around and ran in here and made it just in time. So I don't know what your morning has been like, but luckily, no matter what, we know that God meets us exactly where we're at, and we make it just on time. Let us join together in prayer. Almighty God, from whom we come and to whom our spirits return, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. You are a refuge and a strength, a very present help in trouble. Grant us your blessing in this hour, and enable us so to put our trust in you, that our spirits may grow calm and our hearts be comforted. Lift our eyes beyond the shadows of earth and help us to see the light of eternity. So may we find grace and strength for this and every time of need. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's two scriptures that I want us to uh, think about and wrestle with today. And on their own, they may not make the most sense. One is the one that we heard on uh, Good Friday. And there's a part where Jesus is dying. And Jesus calls his mother over, his favorite disciple. And it's that moment where you think there's going to be this big, deep, kind of parental and son moment as Jesus is dying. And Jesus looks at her and goes, uh, yeah, well then, I'm no longer your son. This is your son. And, and uh, disciple, this is now your mother. And the next scripture that we're going to look at is comes from Luke 24, 13 to 35. But after Easter, I get tired of reading the script, so I'm just going to tell you. Two of the disciples were leaving after Jesus died. Nothing was as expected. They were walking, and as they were walking, they were, I think, complaining, grieving, talking about everything that had just came about. 
And someone walks up behind them and says, what's going on? And they get annoyed just like anyone does when they butt in. Because let's be honest, for us who are grieving this day, it feels like we are on the other side of a brick wall. The rest of the world is going on and we are stuck on this other side in our grief. And in that moment on that other side, surrounded by their grief, they go, you idiot, don't you know who died? Chris goes, no. They continue to tell this story and they're walking. And my guess is they're just getting more and more annoyed. Finally, they get to their destination and it's about to be dark. And as darkness comes, they go, look, you can't keep walking. You're going to get literally mugged and killed. You've annoyed us the entire day. Just punch, stay, and eat. And they do. And the person breaks bread. And immediately they go, it was God with us the entire way. I have talked enough. We now have the opportunity for you all uh, to share uh, some brief moments of your thankfulness for God and some stories uh, that we have. Now, uh, we have one person called Dibs on First. That's it, and especially when it's with the family, so I'm sure he's back. So you know, I've done many, many speeches in my lifetime here. Not here, but in my lifetime, but this one's going to be hard. So I'm going to really, really try to hold this together. So, um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming um, and being here today. And as I look out, Across this room, I can see that my uncle has touched many, many lives um, in, in many different ways. So um, he was able to um, have many great accomplishments and got to do and see many things in the world that a lot of people don't get to do. Um, and he, but yet, he remained a modest and a simple man. And um, he would never ever, at least in my whole time of being alive with him, he never boasted about any of the achievements that he had made. His father passed on and he took my, his mother, my grandmother, under his wing and um, he loved her so tenderly and so dearly. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, my mother and my father divorced when I was very young and he unspokenly took um, that role of being with the father to me. Um, he and my grandmother took me to my very first restaurant that I ever ate at. Um, as I grew and uh, got older and chose my path in life, um, I too, making mistakes along the way, he was there as a guide and a listener, and at times he was that voice of reason and, um, and kind of that voice that you didn't really want to hear what he was saying, but you respected it. As my family grew, he grew with us. There was never a single holiday or a celebration until this Christmas that he did not spend with my family. And that was only because he was too weak to make a trip to come. He and my husband had a very unique relationship. And at times, the two of them together was a little scary. <laughs> but my husband absolutely adored him. He enjoyed spending time at his cabin with our girls, Tom and Katie, Heather, and um, Kimberly. And as um, they continued to get older, um, also our son-in-laws, um, and our grandchildren, to the tune of 15 of them. Um, he enjoyed um, going and um, having like four-wheeler rides and side-by-sides and some of those pictures, you know, obviously were of us during those times, um, riding the trails, spotting deer and other wildlife. Um, there was playtime, but he always had an agenda too. And you had to do the chores and the things that needed to be done. Um, before you went ahead and had that, that playtime. <laughs> I will also miss the multitudes of calls that he had made to me asking me for medical advice or questions. I have several and many different medical degrees behind my name, but I will stand right here and tell you MD is not one of them. But he kind of called me as his phone friend um, when there were things that he did not understand. 
I want to thank Roy for being there, to take him to his appointment, and help take care of him during those last months that he struggled through. And I also want to especially thank him. You were a son. In the beginning, he was your mentor. He taught you and guided you. But you also, as your friendship grew, your companionship and your relationships, I think you were teaching him along the way too. I will never, I, I will forever be indebted to you for always being there for him and being the person who never ever wavered in him and showed him that everlasting love. There will be one more empty chair at one table now, going forward. And I hope that when he walked through those golden gates at his final resting place, he not only was greeted by Grandma and Grandpa, but he was also greeted by my husband, John, too. Heaven, you have your hands full. I will forever be grateful and blessed by all the years of memories that nobody will ever be able to erase. Rest in peace, my dear uncle, and enjoy your eternal rest. You deserve it, and I love you. And until that day, when we get to be together again. As they were first called pits. Is there someone else who would like to share? I'm going to sit down if you would like to share your bike and come up. list. 
I was a problem child when I was younger, living in Harrisburg, running the streets, getting arrested, having a lot of problems. Well, my mother decided it was time to have Big Brothers Big Sisters Association step in and get me a big brother. And I guess who it was. It was Wood. Well, this man took a city kid out hunting, which that was not something you would think you would take a kid off the street and give a gun to him and say, let's go hunting. Um, fishing. He taught me a lot. My mother passed. Uh, I never knew my father. My mother passed, and I was only 11 years old. Well, with Woody being my big brother, he couldn't see me being bounced around from home to home, so he petitioned to get me as a foster child, and he did. He got me in, and he, he showed me, like Jim, the construction business and two dollars an hour. <laughs> I actually got up to five though at the end, and. Uh, with him, there was there was definitely no pulling the wool over his eyes. He had you down pat. He knew me inside and out. We traveled. He took me fishing in Canada. Um, I always had a dream of going marlin fishing. So we went off to Poco, and we went marlin fishing. Guess who catches the marlin? Woody. <laughs> and. Uh, he didn't quite get it to the boat, though. I actually got a picture of it, at the side of the boat coming up, and you can see the lure that was there just leaving the fish's mouth. Perfect picture. Where it is anymore, I don't know. But that was a picture that we talked about for years. He, uh, he was definitely a giving person. I'll, I'll give him that. He was the only person I knew who's never been married but has more grandchildren than, I don't know what, I mean, more children and grandchildren for a man that's never been married. He took care of me and he took care of George Cope. He's here in the audience too. He raised us both and he gave us a lot. And we were a handful. We were definitely a handful. Um, I can go on and on and just keep you know, propping him up, but uh, you all know Woody. I don't have to prop him up. He propped himself up with the way he treated all of us. He's with 
God, I hope he's happy. Thank you.
story I want to share, and it's actually never been public. It's been in the family before, but today's about me, and I need some therapy, so here we go. <laughs> I was about 10. I have a sister who's four years older than me, and we have a cabin in Lycoming County. It's a couple hundred acres. I don't remember offhand. Some of it sold, some of it bought. Uh, and when we turned about 10, um, my grandfather, who was my best friend, took me up to the cabin. He said, we're going to camp out tonight. I said, great, nothing new. He said, but you're going to be alone. And I went, where are you going? <laughs> And he's like, well, I'm going to take you somewhere, and this is going to be the beginning of you starting to, to learn the land. I was like, okay, let's do this. Every time we walked out, he would tell me where things were at, and he said, all right. Uh, and he took me to the farthest point that I rarely went to because it was just up a giant hill, and I didn't feel like walking there. So he knew that, and he took me up there, and he said, all right. And he said, I want you to wait here until this alarm goes off. I'm like, where do I do that? up to you. I went, what? And he said, oh, hold on a second. And he put a blindfold over my Now look, my grandmother is dead. If any of you work for uh, um, Children and Youth Services, this is not legal. We know that. All right? I was an 80s baby. This is how we were raised. We were lucky if our parents got home at like 7 or 8. This was his idea of teaching. And I went through this night with so much fear. And it started and I went, all right, where the heck? No idea where I was at, and I remember him going, all right, any time the hill goes down, that's where you meet the creek. This makes no sense to you, but as I said, this is about me, not you all, it's my therapy right now. Uh, and so I started walking, and I kept walking, and then after a while, I sat and I went, all right, we've hunted here before. I remember this place, and I sat there, and I went, Boop. it's summer. In the summer, we feed the deer apples. I know where that's at, so I went. And that whole night, I kind of went through my own adventures in remembering things and finding things that we had left. And then I went, and the morning came, and he came back, and he said, how was your day? And we talked all about it. Fast forward a couple of years, and I get the guts to ask my sister. This was at his funeral, and I pulled my sister to the side. My sister and I were very close. Uh, but for some reason, we both were too afraid to ever talk about this. I said, Becky, I said, did Grandpa, when you were, and her eyes got big, and she goes, yes. And I said, what did you do? And just, I explained, I explained everything I did. I said, I ate apples. I said, I didn't sleep much. I said, I remember looking at the stars, just being super scared. I said, what did you do? She said, I sat down and cried all night long. And I made certain that you were different ways. <laughs> Let's pray. Almighty God, we come to you this day with so many different emotions. And yet, Lord, here we are. Over these next few moments, speak to us. Allow us to see you at work, not only through we life, but through us now, through each other. Give us moments of hope and assurance that you are in your name. We pray. Amen. I think in a lot of ways, our story mimics that of our gospel reading. We're like those disciples. Going in an ex unexpected place at an unexpected time. We didn't expect to be here. We, we all know that at some point we're going to die, but we're never ready for that moment. We're never ready for that phone call, that email, that text. But they were walking and they were dealing with the truth. The person that they loved was no longer there. And my guess is as they walked and as they talked, they were reminded of all of those things that, like Jesus, we reminded us of. Now, I'm not saying Woody was Jesus. We all know that is not the case for anyone. But I'm saying when they still lost a loved one, at this moment, Jesus was just someone who had died. And as they're walking, they're dealing with all of these emotions. And my guess is they often have that question of, what do we do what is that next step? Now, see, now in, in a sermon, uh, normally you try to pinpoint one area of scripture and in the person's life and try to make it connect. And never in my life have I had such an easy job with that. As a pastor, it is my role to constantly say, look, we are part of a family. As believers in God, we are called to be each other's brothers and sisters, parents, mothers, and fathers. We're called to take care of one another. That we 
when you see someone hurting just like Christ did to us, pull us in and make them part of your family. That's one of the hardest things a pastor does. And then you come along one day and you hear the story of a man that lived it out in a way that was so prophetic. And we can actually say, can you imagine how many grandchildren he has for someone who never had a kid? One of the things we see in his life is that he never traveled alone. He always brought them along and said, look, this is why I love the world. Let me show you why you can love it too. He knew the importance of yes, a list, but also of just simply being there. One of the hardest things when we lose someone is what next? Well, we need to follow just what the disciples did. One foot in front of the other. Keep going. And as much as we want to stop and be here, Woody is not with us. The Woody we want is not the one that was here a week ago or a month ago or two months ago. So we keep going. But we don't keep going as though he never existed. It's the opposite. Our goal and our purpose is to take those things that made him who he was to us, that made him show us that love, and to share it with other people. To do what he did and to say, well, you're not part of my family. Well, okay, now you are. Come in. The important thing is that Woody would not want us to let his seat stay empty. He would say, there's someone else out there who needs it. These aren't my words, they are the ones that I constantly go to when I'm struggling with questions and with grief. It's by my name. When great trees fall, when great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder, lions hunker down in tall grasses and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly see the hurt with a hurtful clarity. Our memory suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die, and our reality bound to them takes leave of us. Our souls dependent upon their nurture now shrink. Our minds formed and informed by their radiance fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark, cold haze. And when great souls die after a period, peace blooms slowly and always irregularly. Spaces fill with kind of soothing electric vibration. Their senses restored, never to be the same. Whisper to us, they existed. They did exist. We can be, and we can be better because they existed. It was also at my grandmother's funeral that my grandmother pulled me aside, and we had a conversation. And I said, uh, she said, I heard you and your sister talking. I wanted to tell you something. I was like, oh, man. Like, we talked a lot about inappropriate stuff. I didn't know what I was in trouble for. Uh, and she said, I want to tell you a little bit um, about your night out. At this point, I was still like, night out? I was 22. I was like, night out? You know, about night out. And she was that night when you stay there. Uh, she said, do you know you were never alone? I went, shut up. She goes, no. She said, he never left. She said, do you know why you, there are more tree stands on our property than there are hunters? Mm -hmm. No. Said, because that's the way he watched you. He went from tree stand to tree stand. He said that night when your sister stood in the woods and cried, he said it was the longest night of his life. <laughs> this old grizzled man sat in the trees and my guess is cried and went, what am I doing? story mimics the disciples in that even when we don't expect it, even when we don't recognize it, we aren't alone. 
that my grandfather in no way is like God. Trust me. <laughs> but at that moment, he knew it's the way God watches us, just the way God was with the disciples when they were <clears throat> continuing to walk, to tell the story of Woody, to tell the love. And that's how we get through. That's how we continue to exist. It's by sharing the story, walking together, and knowing that although our lives may never ever be the same, they are so much better because we was a part of them. This is what gives us hope this day. And this is what gives us the ability to sit in a room and go, you know what? This sucks. But we made us family and we are going to make it through. Let us now join together in our prayer of thanksgiving. God of love, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us even to this day. For the gift of joy in days of health and strength, and for the gifts of your abiding presence and promise in days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and friends and for our baptism. Place in your church with all who have faithfully lived and died. Above all else, we thank you for Jesus who knew our griefs, who died our death and rose for our sake and who lives and prays for us. And so, as we join now together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou hast the kingdom, the power, May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Did you know there will be some closing remarks from uh, Representative?